bless you. You can be seated. Thank you so much, guys. You know, when I stepped into that pool in the Jordan River, there were some things that went through my mind that came back to me as I was preparing for today's message and getting ready and thinking about greater and how great the love of God is for us. Thinking of how I understood, and by the way, if you know, feel free to take off your mask if you would like while you're sitting. While we're singing, we really ask you to wear your mask because that's the most dangerous time uh, that we could become spreaders, you know, even if someone wasn't aware of having the coronavirus. So, but feel free to take them off, but um, if we sing again, please put them back on. But as I stepped into those waters and reflected, I had talked to one of my good friends about why I wanted to be rebaptized again. And he was the district superintendent of, a, of another great district, and, and he encouraged me to do so. And again, I'm not encouraging you. It's not that my first baptism wasn't good enough. It's just that I understood. I've done a lot through the years of 25th wedding anniversaries and 50 wedding anniversaries where people have asked me, would I do their vows all over for them again? And I, of course, I explained to them, I said, you know, your vows were real good the first time, but if you would like to do it again, I'll be happy to do it for you, you, you know, again. Sometimes it's that matter of understanding. And a couple by the name of Timmy and Elvina, I will never forget talking to them as they explained how they knew so much more about love and how they understood what their vows meant so much more now. In the book of John, chapter 13, in verse 1, Jesus said, the, Jesus said he had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth, and read this last part with me, and now he loved them to the very end. Say that again. Now he loved them to the very end. Don't you really appreciate those folks who love each other to the very end? Those folks who make a lifetime commitment and they love one another right to the very end of life. And that word end there is actually the word teleos, telos, which means to fulfill the purpose. In other words, Jesus fulfilled the purpose of love. He loved them to the very end. Sometimes when I'm talking to young people, and I love young love, I love talking to people who have young love. I love listening to them tell me. All of a sudden, a young man that I know because his parents have told me, how do we get our son to write a thank you note to his great Aunt Martha for sending him a pair of gloves for his graduation gift? And I said, I'll be happy to talk to him about the value of writing a thank you note. So I talked to the teenager in our church and he says, first of all, Pastor, I don't know who Great Aunt Martha is. And why do we call her Great Aunt Martha? If she was so great, she would have never sent me a pair of gloves for graduation. Now, we laugh and chuckle at that, but that very same young man, when he fell in love, suddenly he became a poet. Suddenly he could pin words across a card or a letter or an email and he would tell me poetically about this great love that he had. And I'm sure there are some men in this congregation that when you first fell in love with your wife, you were a poet and probably been a long time since you've written one of those really good, mushy poems that you hope nobody finds. My dad, the saint that he was or wasn't sometimes, <laughs> he found a bunch of things that I had written for Becky and in front of my teenage sons and my teenage daughter, he made this big presentation about pulling all this mushy stuff out that I really wish nobody else had ever read. But he had sat in the barn and chuckled and pulled out his favorite ones and read them to Becky in front of our children. Boy, did they have a time with that. You see, we understand love, but Jesus is talking about a greater love here. He loved his disciples. He loved you and I to the very end. I thought what I would use as an illustration for this this morning is from the book of John, chapter 13 and verse 4, if you want to follow along with me. Jesus got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, and poured water into a basin. 
And then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had wrapped around him. In other words, Jesus laid aside his teacher's robe. He laid aside his mantle and <clears throat> he girded himself with the towel. It shocked the disciples. You know this because I've talked to you about it before. But it shocked the disciples that Jesus would do this very menial thing for them, washing their feet. But this is great love. This is what great love does. I used to wonder if anyone could ever love me greatly. I used to wonder before I married my wife, could anybody ever love me the way that my parents had loved me or loved me any deeper? And 40-something years of marriage have taught me, yes, not only do I know how to be loved that way by my wife, but, but I know how to be loved that way. I know how to give love that way. I learned how to love that way from this congregation when a number of years ago I went through a crisis in my life physically and the love that people express. You see, perfect love casts out all fear of being willing to serve somebody. I can remember when I came home with all the infusions and everything that accompanied that, the blood pumps that I had, the colostomy that I had. I can remember saying to Becky, I will sleep in another bed. I will sleep. And she said, no, you're sleeping here beside me. And I was ashamed. I didn't want her to see me like this. And yet she would put her arms around me and love me. And I remember laying there one night with her head on my shoulder and hearing the blood pump sucking and doing what it does and all of a sudden just beginning to weep because I realized I was experiencing great love and my pride was pushing that kind of love away because I didn't want to receive that kind of love. And I think that's sometimes what happens to us in our lostness and in our sin that somehow or another we don't think that anyone should ever give their life for us at Calvary. Becky and I took a tour with a senator's aide in Washington, D.C. as we toured the war memorials. And seeing them at night was a totally different experience. And I can remember them describing the, the wall, the, the wall that scratched like a scar into the face of the earth for the Vietnam War Memorial. I can remember going to the World War I and the World War II memorials and sometimes tears flowing out of our eyes as we reflected but in my journal, if you go back and look at the pictures that I've put in the journal and the things that I wrote, I call them not walls of memorial, but walls of love because of the sacrifice and the suffering that had been paid in order for you and I to enjoy the freedoms and the liberties that seem to be treated so cavalierly, so casually today and taken as a license to be self-centered rather than to love like Jesus loves. That's the kind of love that was paid for our freedom as a nation. It's the kind of love that was prayed for, paid for is our freedom as Christians. And it's not that those who died never feared going into battle. It's not that those who, who died for us never worried about what would happen to them or what happened to their families but many soldiers and many airmen and sailors have told me before they knew what it meant when Jesus says, perfect love casts out all fear. Perfect love will cast out all fear, but I want to tell you something. Perfect fear will cast out all love. When people somehow or another fear what they may lose by loving rather than what they might gain by loving, that they miss out on the greater love that Jesus Christ has for us. Because until we recognize the gravity of our sin, till we recognize the gravity of our lostness, till we recognize that without Jesus Christ, for eternity we are separated from God and miss out to the very end of what it means to have been born again. Because in our pride we say, I don't need a Savior. In our pride we refuse to recognize just how sin has corrupted us. Fear, pride, they're remarkably potent antidotes to love. Fear and pride are remarkably potent antidotes to the love in a marriage, love in a family. They're just remarkable. It takes humility to love and to be loved. It takes grace to love and to be loved. It takes grace to do what Jesus did. 
You know, there are times when people ask me, as someone asked me yesterday on the telephone, isn't it difficult being away from your family during this pandemic? You know, it is. It's difficult to be away. I want to see my mom so bad. I want to see Becky's mom so bad. My, see my family and my sisters, all of our family that was coming here for Thanksgiving. We've canceled those Thanksgiving plans just to protect everybody during this pandemic and all of the planning that had been made. It's, it's a difficult time, and I'm sure some of you are going through that. But you see, I make every effort to call. I make every effort to email. I make every effort to write. I make every effort to inquire of my nieces and nephews, my, 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 my sisters and their husbands. I make every effort to stay in touch with my, parent, my mother's and Becky's mother. I make those efforts for one reason, because Jesus says, remain in my love. And though there may be a thousand miles separating us during this pandemic, I am learning what it means to remain in the love of of my family and for them to remain in my love but I tell you I am learning even more in this pandemic what it means to remain in the greater love of God he has not abandoned us he has not left us and of the six funerals that I have preached during this time the families that have shared with me we know the love of God we know the love of God so how does one overcome that fear? Well, I, I think Jesus shows us how to love greatly in John 13. Number one, get up. If nobody else is going to love, you decide to get up and do something about it. If nobody else is going to serve, you decide to get up and do something. I'm sure, listen to me, look at me. I am sure that Jesus did not walk into that room intending to wash their feet. There should have been someone there to have washed their feet. That was the custom of the day. We don't understand that, but let me illustrate it like this. Many of you, when I've come into your homes during the wintertime, you have offered me a pair of slippers to put on. And you've always said to me, Pastor, don't worry, they're clean. I don't know why you feel the need to say that, but I appreciate knowing that they're clean. Because we know we don't track in to one another's homes in the wintertime. The dirt and the slush that we pick up and the salt on people's hardwood floors or their carpets. We know better than that. It's called being civil. It's called being polite. Well, in the custom of that day, it's the same thing. You walked into someone's home. Someone washed their feet. And nobody else was willing to do what the lowest of servants would do. So Jesus got up and he served them. So if no one else is willing... You and I always have to be willing to get up and to serve. You know, and the problem that I run into sometimes with people is this. They failed. You know, they, they've had a spectacular failure. They failed. Maybe they failed morally. Maybe they failed spiritually. Maybe they failed in their ministry. Listen, everybody's going to fail. Everybody doesn't have to fail morally, but everybody's going to fail. You will not get anything accomplished unless you're willing to fail. And if you let one failure sideline you, if you let one failure keep you from serving God and serving other people, then you are not loving to the very end. You are not fulfilling the purpose for which God created you for. Of course people fail. The pastor that I called who had been sidelined because of a marital affair, and he had broke his marriage vows, he had broke faith with his Lord, he had broke faith with his wife and children, he broke faith with his church, and after several years, no one had heard from him, I asked about him, so I called him, and, and was able to be fortunate enough to, to be able to meet with him, and to be a part of the restoration and healing process, and to see him back in gospel ministry, preaching the word, and doing good works for the kingdom of heaven, but he was bound by this fear, because I failed. Jesus was washing the feet of Judas Iscariot, knowing that he would betray him. And still Jesus got up and served him. Don't let the fear of failure, nor let the fact that somebody else failed ever stop you from serving God. Never let it stop you from loving. The book of Proverbs says in chapter 24 and this verse 16, the godly may trip seven times, but they will get up again. Somebody say, come on, victory. They will get up again. Say that with me. They will get up again. It's not a failure anyway if you learn something from it. Secondly, I'd say this morning, be courteous. 
And you say, Pastor, where in the world did you get that from the story of Jesus washing their feet? Because it was the courteous thing to do. When did courtesy fall out of style? My wife loves to tell the story right after we moved up here. You know, you go into a grocery store in the south, if there's a man going out uh, ahead of you or behind you, he'll open the door for a lady, he'll open the door for a woman. It just, that's the way it happens. Becky was leaving Farmer Jack's at the time, and she stopped, and the man behind her ran into her, and he says, what'd you stop for? She said, I was waiting on you to open the door. He goes, you're not from around here, are you, lady? It's the culture that we grew up in, but it's, this is not a cultural thing. This is what love does. Love is courteous. Jesus just simply took off his robe, his teacher's robe. You see, that robe was a symbol of who he was, and I'm going to tell you, people wear, people wear their symbols of authority, don't they? <clears throat> I mean, you look at a general, you look at a soldier in the army who's earned his badges, <coughs> could I have some water please, who's earned his badges, and by golly, sometimes when they walk out, it looks like a display, it looks majorly important, They're, they wear them with pride, and they should wear them with pride, you look sometimes at some of the people and the things that they do, and, and they wear their authority, they wear their robes. But Jesus was willing to take off his coat and take off his robe and he cast it over to the side and what he did then was expose himself and he wrapped a towel around his waist. The towel reached to his knees, his robe reached to his ankles because the robe covered everything. But for the servant who was going to get dirty and muddy serving other people, Jesus laid that aside. It was the courteous thing to do. You are at your best when you help other people become their best. You are not at your best when you're performing at your best. You are at your best when you're helping someone else succeed. It's interesting that Albert Einstein, towards the end of his life, he took down the pictures of his heroes off of his wall, and he hung up the pictures of Albert Schweitzer and of Gandhi because of the way they had served. Because of the way that they helped others. Schweitzer practicing as a missionary doctor in Africa. Gandhi as he was leading the people of the Dalits of people of India and trying to gain their freedom. Number three, what I see from this is how we learn to love greater is we have to get close to people. We have to get close and that can be awfully difficult you know, if you're an extrovert, let's just be honest. You know, I have a lot of extrovert friends. But if you're an extrovert, you get close to people, but then when they're gone, they're gone. You just don't know they're around anymore. You're the life of the party. You walk into the room. Everybody's glad to see you. And we thank God for your personality. But, you know, out of sight, out of mind, that's the way people are with you. You know that you have to struggle with that. If you've become a good leader, if you've become a good husband, good father, good employee or good employer, you know you struggle with that. If you're an introvert, you're kind of afraid to get close to people. You're kind of afraid to let people into your circles. Matter of fact, you have maybe two or three people that you've allowed into your circle because if anybody gets close, they might hurt you or they might not understand you. And yet, as it is, we both, extroverts and introverts, we both have to wrestle with this thing of learning how to get close to people. Jesus got down close, and if I could leave the stage and leave the camera behind, I would go down, Devin, and I would grab your feet, and I would begin to, you know, I won't do it because I won't scare anybody, but I would took off my shirt, and I'd have got some water and washed your feet, got close, and you would have been uncomfortable for me to do that, wouldn't you, Devin? I knew you would. And Peter was uncomfortable. He says, Lord, you can't do this. You can't do this. Lord, look at my toenails. Look at my feet. Do you know how many hospital rooms I've been in? Do you know how many feet I've seen? And people say, oh, cover up my feet, Pastor. Cover up my legs, Pastor. And I go, it's okay if you're comfortable. It doesn't bother me, Pastor. I don't want you to see. I go, it's okay. You see, getting close to people and we discover something. They have warts just like we do. <laughs> and I know you drove all the way to church in a pandemic to hear somebody tell you you have warts this morning. 
I, don't you just feel edified and like you can leave today saying, come on, victory. The pastor told me I had warts. He who was flawless, he who had no warts, was washing the feet of those. He got close to them. They saw, listen to me, they saw what God was like. He is not distant. He is not far. He is the God in the book of Jeremiah that says, Seek me with all of your heart, and you shall find me. And maybe you're watching today, or you're here in this service today, and you have no understanding why I came. Maybe you're wondering, why can't I turn this off of YouTube right now? It's because God has come close to you this morning in this word and in this message to tell you how much he, you matter to him. He knows your warts. He knows your sins. He knows your flaws. He knows my sins, my warts, my flaws. And yet he still gets close to me. It's what makes Peterson's translation of Acts chapter 17 where The Apostle Paul is speaking to lost people, people who are serving a multitude of gods and people who are kind of covering their backside because they just put up a statue to the unknown God. They just want to be sure they were getting them all, you know. And he says, you really don't know God, but he says, God made the entire human race and made the earth hospitable with plenty of time and space for living so we could seek after God and not just grope around in the dark, but actually find him. He doesn't play hide and seek with us. He's not remote. He's near. Say it with me. He's near. Say it again. He's near. He is near. We live and move in him and can't get away from him. And then he quotes a pagan poet. He quotes a poet that's not a Christian. He says, one of your poets said it well, we're the God created. Why do you think Jesus has left us here? And why do you think Jesus has let us live during this time of a corona pandemic? It's so that the people who are seeking and looking for answers... And we've watched that happen at Woodland during this time. People who are looking for God, looking for hope, looking for understanding. And yes, there will be scars like the Vietnam Memorial. There will be scars like the World War II and the World War I memorials. Yes, they will be cut deep into our memories. And yes, there are already cards that I'm sending out to comfort people because of the losses they've experienced during this time. But one thing we will know, God was near to us during this time. Yesterday, a mother, a wife that I had married 17 years ago here in this sanctuary to her husband who still lies unresponsive almost three months later. She sent me pictures of their wedding day. She sent me text messages with scriptures. And I came in and was praying for them yesterday and over here on this side of the sanctuary, about right there where I was standing just a few moments ago, I felt the Lord just lay in my heart. And when I say I felt, that doesn't mean I heard a voice. It just was so real. I knew it was God. Have you ever had that moment where you just knew it was the Holy Spirit putting something on your heart? And I began to call out and say, Lord, you are the God who calls the things that are not as though they were begin to intercede and pray and somehow or another I can't explain it but I was in God's love praying that way and it was as though I was with him by his bed I know I wasn't I was right there I opened up my eyes just to be sure I was right there it's what I was trying to illustrate to you by saying even though we're separated we remain as a family in one another's love. My nieces, my nephews, my sisters, our mothers. And there is some way that you and I are living in the greater love of God that is greater than any trial, any conflict, any racial division, any political division, all of the horror that is taking place around the world right now. We are in the love of God, and God is going to pull us through this time going to pull us through this time. So be available. Let God use you. 
Let God take your life and do something. Be available to not just those that are successful. I mean, let's face it, we all want to know successful people, don't we? We all want to be around successful people, don't we? We're, we're always looking for the people who've achieved greatness. And we like to say, I told you a few moments ago, it was a senator's aid. We weren't taking a paid tour. We were given a tour by a senator's aid. And I would call his name out, but we were given a personalized tour and fed it and treated well. But you know, those aren't the people that Jesus sought out. They sought Jesus out. We have to be available to serve the lowest among us. We have to be willing to serve the greatest as well. But we have to not just limit ourselves to being available to those that are successful. Because here's what I've learned in life. Do not miss this. If you're listening at home, do not miss this. I love success, but in my experience, poverty is more prevalent than prosperity. In my experience, failure is more prevalent than successes. And if we don't learn how to fail with people and get up and serve again, we will never know what it means to love till the very end. And so we have to be available to both the successes and we have to be available to those who are failures as well. Stoop down. Reach out to those who are oppressed. Share their burdens. Read it with me. And so complete Christ's law. Which was Christ's law? A new commandment that I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. That's the law of Christ. And then finally, get engaged. And I'm not talking about marriage. Get engaged. Get involved. Find a place to serve with the love of God. You say, Pastor, I, I can't do it. I, yet I, I understand that. I, if anybody up in this sanctuary this morning understands that, I understand it. But here's something else that I heard that uh, the U.S. Senate Chaplain Lloyd John Ogilvie say, and boy, did this ring a bell with me. He said these words. He says, without God, we can't. But God will not without us. God put you here for a reason. And as the Senate chaplain spoke those words to the United States senators in a, in a message to the Senate, I am speaking those words to you this morning. God says, you cannot do it without me. But he also says, I will not do it without you. Go you into all the world. Serve one another. Encourage one another. Love one another as I have loved you. Lift up one another. Give. Sacrifice. These are the things that God says to us. So that the memorials and the scars that we leave behind us, our children and grandchildren will stand up and say, do not call it a war memorial. Do not call it a memorial to my dad or to my mom or to my grandparents. But call it what it is. It was an act of love. It was an act of sacrifice. Sacrifice. They loved us the way that Jesus Christ loved us. Somebody give him a hand of praise this morning. Well, I'm out of time. Pastor Rick, if you would come, and Becky, if you'd go to the piano, I want you to stand with me. You say, Pastor, don't you have more to say? Yes, I do, but I'm out of time right now. We're in a whole new reality with live streaming and things of that nature. So I want to encourage you, go through the growth work. If your small group is using the, the, the notes, then I've given you some talk about it notes as well. You can call the office. We'll help you with these things. We want to love our community better than we've ever loved our community before. We want to be available to our community. And we want to be a voice of healing. And I just say to you what I say every Sunday, there is no greater love. There's no greater joy than knowing Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. It's the greatest life in the world. And giving your life to Jesus is not about becoming a member of this church. It's about making a personal decision to give your heart and your life to Jesus. And if you've watched this long, I want to say it again, it's not an accident. And if you're here and you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, it's not an accident that you're here. God brought you here today to understand not only how great his love was for you, that he would give his only begotten son to 
but to show you how you can love other people. The great ones aren't found on the stages of this world. They're found on their knees, washing one another's feet, serving one another in the most practical, godly ways that you can think of. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we thank you for everyone that has watched today and for those that have gathered with us in worship. We thank you for the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. We thank you that as we held the wafer and the cup in our hands and we took the rose, that we're reminded just how great your love is. And we thank you that, Lord, now we see several ways that we can just love greatly like you loved us. For the one who's struggling to receive love, Lord, God, they're looking at their warts, they're looking at their flaws, they're, God, something's keeping them from receiving your love or maybe the love of their family or the forgiveness that is offered to them. Would you help them right now to open up their heart to you, warts and all. I never understood, and I want you to listen if you're watching, I never understood how difficult it could to be loved until I went through what I went through a few years ago. And you may think it's impossible that God could ever forgive you of your sins, but God knows you and he still came to this earth to serve you, to die for you. And when he comes again, It will not be as a servant. It will be as the risen, triumphant, conquering king for all of those who gave their lives to him. So I'm going to invite you to pray this prayer with me. And pray it. Just make it your own words. Make it your own prayer right now. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for my sins. Thank you for loving me once and all. You know everything about me. And I know I need your love. I need your presence. And I need to learn how to love to the very end. So as much as I know how, I commit my life to you today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now before Pastor Rick comes and dismisses us, may the Lord who made us, may the Lord who shaped us, may the Lord who created us in his image so that we could learn what it was like not only to be loved, but to love one another. May he bless you and make you prosperous and productive in everything you do. The Lord bless you. Let's give him a hand of praise this morning. Would you do that?